Thank you. So I was interested in talking on this, this bit of the, the program because of the uh, for everyone part of performance for everyone. Well, Jake has shown us you know, game-changing, cutting-edge browser technologies. And it can sometimes seem like there's a tension between that, what's in the latest and greatest browsers, versus the for everyone part. Like, but the great thing about the web is that you can access it from anywhere using any kind of device, any kind of old browser, and it should still work, right? It's for everyone. So how do we get to use the latest, greatest browser technologies and still ma maintain this kind of performance for everyone? It seems from the outside, I think, to be, to be a, um, two things that are in opposition. But I put it to you that they're, they're not in opposition and they can be combined. And the way we combine them is through a process. It's how we approach building for the web. So I'm not really going to be talking about a technology, um, just about a, a methodology, I guess, about how we, how we build things. And, and like Lucy, I've got three steps. And, and here are my three steps for approaching building on the web. One is that you identify the core functionality of what it is you're building. Now, not every bit of functionality, the core functionality. Then two, you make that functionality, the core functionality available using the simplest possible technology, and then you enhance. And that's, that's what kind of where you want to be spending your time, because that's the fun part. But it's, it's worth doing steps one and two first. I'll give you some examples. All right, step one. We want to identify the core functionality of what we're building. Let's say we're building a news site, right? We're, we're providing the news. And we're trying to identify what's the core functionality here. Well, it's pretty clear in this case, it's to enable people to access the news. Now, we're not talking about technology here. We're not talking about particular you know, technologies that will enable people to access the news. Just what's the functionality? What is it that people want to do? They want to access the news. OK, done. That's it. Step one, done. A bit more complicated, suppose we've got some kind of social network where people can uh, see messages from their friends and they can send messages to their friends, um, post things to each other across the world, right? Well, that's the core functionality right there, sending and receiving messages. Again, don't think about the technology behind it yet, just what's the core functionality behind the service? Lots of other things we can add on top, but the core functionality, sending and receiving messages, right? Similarly, if we had a photo sharing app, the clue is in the name, photo sharing. You need to be able to see photographs from people, need to be able to uh, provide photographs uh, for myself. Okay, so the ability to, to see and provide photographs, that's the core functionality. Finally, let's say we had one of these uh, online collaboration tools where people can write things and they can edit and they can share. Well, there we go. Those verbs right there are the, the core functionality of uh, writing, editing, sharing. Okay, so it doesn't take long to identify the core functionality. Once you've done that, this bit a little trickier is, how would you make that functionality available using the simplest possible technology? Not the best, the simplest. So here we are thinking about reach. What would enable that core functionality for the maximum number of people? We're not thinking about the, you know, what, what the experience would be like, really, whether it's going to be you know, painful or, or really seamless. Just how do we get the most number of people to, to access that core functionality? Well, going back to the examples, in the case of um, uh, news, uh, well, uh, the, core, the simplest technology would be to use HTML to mark up the news. I mean, the simplest technology is just put it online in a plain text document. That would, you know, that would ensure access for everyone. But I'm going to raise the bar slightly and say, let's use structured HTML. Done. That's it. That's uh, enabling the core functionality using the simplest possible technology. A server is sending an HTML page. All right. In the case of the social network, uh, I need to be able to see the messages, probably in reverse chronological order that people have posted. We can do that using HTML. That's the simplest technology. Ah, but I also need to be able to post a message. Uh, well, we can do that in HTML too, using uh, an input, right? Input type equals text in this case. And again, it's going to have to go to the server, and the server will send back the whole thing. Not a great experience, but it works everywhere. Very similar with a photo sharing app. Uh, in this case, it's not messages, it's, it's, it's images, and we can do that with HTML, right? We've got an image element. And again, to provide an image, we, we use a form. Slightly different this time, instead of a, it's just a text input, we've got a file input. So the bar is being raised a bit more for this one. Uh, but still accessible for the, the, the vast majority of people. And in the case of the writing, editing, collabor collaborating uh, product we got here, well, fundamentally, it's another form. It's the text that you type stuff into. All right, so at this point, we've made our service available to the maximum number of people. Great. If we stopped here, you know, I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for the IPO because what you've built works, but it's a bit shit. I mean, you know, 
it, it's available to everyone, but you're not making any use of these, these great technologies that we have at our fingertips. And that's where the third step comes in. This is where you enhance and you start adding in those great technologies. But anything you do from this point on is built on this bedrock of those first two steps where you know things are going to continue working. So in the case of providing news online, we've got structured HTML. Let's make it look good. We'll provide layout using CSS. We've got all sorts of fun things to play with now, right? Flexbox, grid layout, landing in browsers, all this good stuff. We can make great typography using web fonts. Okay? And these are very much enhancements. It might seem weird to think about layout as an enhancement on something like a news site, but when you think about like mobile-first responsive design, that's kind of the, the takeaway message is that your layout is an enhancement. And we, I love typography, and I wish I could say that you know, beautiful typography is the baseline, but it's an enhancement. It's not just an enhancement, it's really important enhancement, um, but it, it's important to remember that every line of CSS you write is a suggestion to the browser. All right, in the case of the, that social network, we've got the messages, and we were able to type in a new message, but every time you do that, it's a full page refresh just to see if anyone's posted anything new. Let's make that a better experience using Ajax. And in fact, we could go further, use things like WebSockets so that we could have new messages arriving you know, without us even having to do anything when we see those new messages arrive. Uh, this won't be supported in every browser. That's OK, because the core functionality is available for everyone. Uh, in the case of photo sharing app, let's do all the other stuff we've done up to this point that I've mentioned. Let's also throw in some more things like uh, let's have the file API so that when that file gets uploaded, before we even send it to the server, we can access it and do things with it in JavaScript. Uh, like we could start adding CSS filters on top of it, put the sepia tone on that picture, right? Uh, and again, not every browser is going to support these technologies. And again, that's okay, right? They're layered on top of the, the core functionality. And in the case of this, this uh, writing application where people are just typing things into a text area, well, we certainly want to introduce Ajax, probably WebSockets, all the other good stuff we've mentioned. Uh, but you know, let's make it resilient to network failures, kind of like what Jake's talking about. Let's like, use local storage in the browser, something like IndexedDB, whatever the technology is you want to try, just go for it. Uh, and yes, let's absolutely put a service worker on there. I have, I have drunk from the service worker Kool-Aid that Jake is selling, uh, and it's... it's a great technology. It's probably the technology I'm most excited about right now. And what I love actually about the design of Service Worker is that it has been designed to be used in this way. It has been designed to be used as an enhancement on top of what you've already got. Because when the user first comes to your site, your service, there is no Service Worker. So you have to make it work without the Service Worker and then add the Service Worker functionality on top. I really, really like that. So Service Worker actually fits very well into this approach. It's an example of a technology that you can certainly use in this way. So this, this three-step approach, one of the reasons I like it is that it kind of works at different scales. I've only been talking about the scale of the entire service, the entire product, right? Um, but you can imagine doing this for every URL. Like, What is the core functionality of this URL, of this page? How do I make that core functionality available you know, to the maximum number of users with the simplest possible technology, and then how do I enhance? And you could go deeper and look at components within a page. Right? You've got your pattern library, your thinking and components now. Well, what's the core functionality of that component? What's the simplest way of making that functionality available? And then how do I, how do I enhance it for, them, for people? Um, I guess what I'm saying here is that it's not a dichotomy. It's not a choice between either you have basic functionality that's available for everyone, or you have an immersive, rich experience that only works on the latest devices and the latest browsers. I'm saying you can have both. Right? You can have your cake and eat it too. I think there's a bit of a misconception about this approach that means you're going to be spending all your time in older browsers. But actually, I find the complete opposite. Because you spent a bit of time in those steps one and two, making sure it works in the old-fashioned way, you know, client-server requests, just like the good old days, that you actually then get to spend all your time at step three trying out these latest and greatest technologies because you've built this kind of bedrock uh, that, that you can work with. But to preempt some of the, the, the questions, I do get pushback. Uh, about this approach, and it kind of falls into two categories. And the first category is that people say, this is too easy, or rather, too simplistic. People will say, well, this is all well and good for your, your simple use case, you know, a simple website, a blog, a personal site, but it couldn't possibly scale to the really complex app that I'm building. And what's interesting is I've heard that criticism before. I remember when you know, the Web Standards Project was trying to convince developers to move from tables for layout into using CSS. And people were pushing back and saying, well, you know, you can use CSS for layout on a simple personal website, but it would never scale to a, a real commercial product. And then, you know, Wired.com redesigned and ESPN.com redesigned and the floodgates opened. Everything changed. 
And likewise, when responsive design came along, there was a lot of pushback from people saying, yeah, nice trick, Ethan. You know, works well on your little personal website, but there's no way it could work on a big commercial site. And then the Boston Globe launched with its responsive layout, and suddenly the floodgates opened. So we've been here before, and I think there is, you know, there's the opportunity here for some flagship uh, modern applications that are accessible to everyone and use the latest technology. But the other pushback I get is people saying, this is, this is too hard. You're saying I should put all this work into making it work, you know, client server, and then I go in and duplicate all my work again, right? We're adding in my Ajax and my service work and all this stuff. That sounds like a lot of work. I have, I have some sympathy for that, because it's like, yeah, I am asking you to do some work up front. It's not as much work as you think. Um, and, and it gets easier. Like, again, the first time we stopped using tables for layout and started using CSS, it was really hard, because we were used to using tables for layout. And the first time, if you've been building fixed width websites for years, and then you try your first responsive layout, and it, is, it was hard, right? But the second time was a bit easier. And the third time, easier still, until it just becomes normal. So yes, initially, this could be hard if you're not used to thinking this way, but it does get easier. Um, there might be some duplicated work, but we've got interesting stuff going on with you know, JavaScript that can run on the server and on the client. Maybe you can share that code. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, what I like about this approach is that you know the way we talk about technical debt, where you make decisions early on that you end up paying for further down the line? Well, by, by using this approach to what you're building, it's kind of like you're creating technical credit. Right? You've got this, this baseline that you're building on top of, and that frees you up to go and, and play with the latest technologies. Right? We talk about being future-friendly, and the, the irony here is that the, the best way to be future-friendly is to be backwards compatible. But that's how I think we can you know, resolve that seeming dichotomy and, and use the latest and greatest game-changing browser features while maintaining you know, that philosophy that four years ago Tim Berners-Lee said as he rose out of the ground at the London Olympics that this is for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Keith, of course. Keith, this is his second name, of course. I got carried away with the wink there. That's and introduced okay. you as, as just Keith. <laughs> um, fantastic, thank you. I was worried to begin with um, because uh, it sounded like um, I had to take this, this, this very back to basics, um, just the raw atom sort of approach. And then you told me I could have my cake and eat it. Yeah. And I, I relaxed a little bit. And now I'm back anxious again. It sounds to me like it, could be a little bit of a reductionist approach. In your, in your numbered sequence there, mm -hmm. um, is there a step before one where you might start with the full rich functionality and then work backwards? Or do you advocate starting with the simplest first? Um, well, there's different ways you could do it. So what you're trying to do is identify the core functionality. And one way of doing that would be to say, well, what's all the possible functionality? And you get all that down. Maybe you're doing this with post-it notes on a wall. You identify all the possible things it could do, and then you refine. Say, is this really core to like the what the user can do? And if it's not, you know, take it away until what you're left with, until you can't take anything more away, and that's the core functionality. Um, that's that's maybe one way of getting at it. I remember like, Matt Marquis, who worked on the Boston Globe. You know, he talked about how um, on that site there are a bunch of features that require JavaScript to work, and if you don't have if JavaScript fails, those features don't work. But he said, reading the news isn't one of them. So it's about deciding. And that's that's a really good feature, but it's not. You know, it would be okay if we made this feature depend on some cutting edge technology or something that isn't supported in every browser. That's absolutely fine. But those core features, you gotta bring the, the bar as low as you can. Good, thank you. So it's not a replacement for big holistic thinking up front as long as you, you still have No, in fact, right that, that can be a good way of, of, of narrowing it down and, and getting to the core functionality. Great stuff, thank you. Um, it seems to me like there's, there's, a, there's a good overlap between what you were talking about. Jake, uh, is this something that, that you've used um, in, in your projects? Well, yeah, I mean, like Jeremy pointed out, the, the, we designed Service Worker that way very deliberately to be progressive enhancement because if you had to you know, wait for the, the, the Service Worker install process before you saw anything on the screen, uh, we would be, you know, our aim was to improve performance and that would, that would kill it. Um, it so the, the process that Jeremy's talking about, it's not just like uh, good for resilience, it is amazing for performance. Like if, there are so many sites out there that are needlessly built in this single page app uh, model where you know, they just serve like a blank page and then JavaScript does everything. And you completely lose data streaming by doing this. Uh, and the, the longer your content, the more you lose. But if you go into something like webpagetest.org uh, and set it to 3G and actually test this stuff, like, um, a server rendered page will, uh, maybe it depends on how much CSS you have, but it'll, it'll start rendering somewhere between 
two, three, four seconds. These single page app approaches will be hitting nine, 10, 11 seconds. So that's the kind of difference we're talking about. By using less technology, mm -hmm. it's a complete win-win. Yeah, thank you, great. Uh, any questions for Jeremy? Anybody tempted to try and be a little bit more um, progressive in their enhancement with their current projects and maybe has a question on how to do that? Yes, please. Um, I think that this progressive enhancement is something that we did pretty well for a while. It was kind of drilled in and we're sort of forgetting it again with the single page apps, as, as you said. Um, is that something you've noticed as well? And is that why you chose to give this talk? Uh, yes, and I don't know whether to be depressed about it or, or excited, but yeah, if you had told me 10 years ago, hey, Jeremy, in 10 years' time, you're still going to be on stage talking about progressive enhancement. You know, I, I, I don't think I would have taken the news well. But then I do understand that um, things move so fast on the web, um, things also get forgotten quickly on the web, and our lessons get forgotten. So it's true. I'm not saying anything new here. I might be talking about newer technologies like Service Worker, but this approach is how we were talking about building for the web since day one. Um, what's interesting is that now we've had enough time to test it. Uh, new technologies come along, okay, the introduction of mobile, and, and does it stand up to that? It's like, actually, yeah, it stands up really well, and every time new game changers come along, it tests this approach, and now I can with confidence say, actually, this approach works really well, and will continue to work, even though I don't know what the game changers will be. I don't know what the next big thing is, I don't know what new technology we'll be looking to experiment with, but I do know, because of the experience of it being so long now, that this approach will, will stand us in good stead. Um, but yeah, I, I am kind of repeating things I've said before. The, the t yeah, I was talking about Ajax 10 years ago and advocating this approach. Now I'm talking about different things and advocating this approach. As a footnote to that question, have we um, dropped the ball with not implementing things like service workers sooner that allow this to happen again? Um, I, I don't think it's about technologies. I think it is more about how we think about the web. And I Probably what's happened is that we, we get a bit distracted or we, we, we see what works in other platforms, like, oh, native is awesome. What's native got? Well, native's got you know, cool animations or it's got access to these APIs, right? How do we get the web to, to work like native? And we start to try and imitate those things, which is great, the, like native or Flash before it or CD-ROMs before that. Um, they all act as like research and development departments for the web. We see, what oh, that works well. Let's use that on the web. But in that, we also fall into the trap of thinking we can build for the web in the same way we would build for, let's say, native or a plugin like Flash or CD-ROM. And when you build for those things, you have a lot more certainty about where what you're building is going to be delivered. It's like either they have the right operating system or they don't. Either it's zero or one, right? It's 100% of what I'm giving them or it's zero. Whereas on the web, it's much more this continuum of like, ah, this browser supports that, but not that. And this connection is flaky, but this, right, it's this, this lumpy, uh, distribution of, of features and support, and I think we've lost sight of that lumpiness. And it's not a, it's not a bad thing that the web has this, this lumpy, because that's how we get the access. That's, that's how it's for everyone, is that um, features are unevenly distributed. So I think that's what we've lost sight of, is that you can't quite build for the web the same way you would build you know, an iOS app or a native app. Uh, and people are getting tempted into thinking, ah, it's just, a, it's just like building this. It's just like building a native app, and it's not. Great, thank you. We've got time for one more, but at this point, I'm just going to ask Sarah to wander up and check the slides already. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, to kind of wrap it up as well, that lumpiness, this kind of, this continuum, I think where we did drop the ball is talking about browser support as this site works in X browser. Now, when you mentioned Mark Marquis with the, the features on the Boston Globe, if the core functionality is identified and you can provide that to everyone, it's just good for business, right? It's just, I, I worked on a large scale betting application a few years ago, and we decided to swim lane features. It was like, this feature will work in this browser, but the site is still usable. People can still place a bet in like IE7. And embracing that lumpiness and identifying core functionality, starting with the smallest and working up, um, it is the performance is for everyone thing completely because the business is satisfied. It's good for business, it's good for users, it's good for developers. Uh, so I think it's a really holistic, but taking, sorry, they're putting the cart before the horse, the, this site works in X, Y, Z browsers, that was our fault. I think we messed up there. Um, uh, yeah, I think the other thing is that we, we never clarified what we meant by support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so when, when you could say like, oh, it's, it's gonna work in IE7, right, people will be able to place the bet in IE7. But if what the uh, 
a person on uh, you know, the marketing team here is, oh, it's going to work the same in IE7 as it mm -hmm. does in the latest browser. That when you say, oh, it's, I support IE7, and they're hearing, oh, you're optimizing for IE7. Yeah. Very different things. And, and we fell into the trap of instead of clarifying that, instead of fighting the fight to say, okay, this is what support means. It's not optimization, it's, it's support. It's enabling core functionality. Instead of that, we ended up actually figuring out how to hack IE7 to get rounded corners or whatever it is that we're you know, trying to make it look the same as the latest Chrome. And we were solving the wrong problems. Completely. Complete waste of everyone's time. Yeah. 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 I think one of the, the, the things that we're, we're trying to do uh, with the web at Google is trying to, to steal the best features from native. Mm -hmm. But the thing we mustn't do is steal the worst features from yes. native. And that's this long, you know, you have to wait for 20 megabytes before you get anything. And, it, and it's so tempting to do that. And we see that on the web a lot. Yep. So we need to take the best from the web, keep the best from the web, but steal the best from native. <laughs> Thank you.